I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. And I'm very, very happy because this week is St. Valentine's Day. Yes, that's right. Valentine's Day is this week. I like Valentine's Day because I get so many Valentines. And candy, too? Yes, and candy, too. And you know what else happens this week? What? I'll give you a hint. The birthday of a very famous American. Who? He was a very famous president. Who? One of the most famous men in the world. Who? You guessed it, Abraham Lincoln. Oh, yeah. I just love Abraham Lincoln. Isn't that wonderful? Abraham Lincoln and Valentine's Day, both in the same week. Yes, and the funnies, too. Oh, yes. Read them, please. Puck the Comic Weekly. Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of page one, hop along, Cassidy. Oh, happy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. Hoppy and some of his friends from the Stebbins Ranch have gone after Calico, leader of the outlaw counterfeiting ring, with the purpose of ending Calico's lawless rule. The secret attack they planned on Sulphur City, the town that Calico runs, was spoiled because one of Calico's men had learned of Hoppy's plan. A ferocious battle ensued, during which Hoppy and two of his men were cornered in the freight office behind some explosives. Things looked very bad for Hoppy. Meanwhile, a wagon drawn by two horses is stopped at the outskirts of the city by two of Calico's men. The driver says, Hey, ain't that shooting? And one of Calico's men says, Forget it. Some lawbreakers drifted into town, gunning for trouble. Till we've settled with them, our orders are to keep all citizens off on the streets. Just then, one of the shots frightens the horses. We'll run away, heading directly at the guards. Now look out, the team's bolting. At last picture, top row, they run directly down the street of Sulphur City. First picture next row in the freight office, one of Hoppy's companions says, Hey, we gotta find cover somewhere else, Hoppy. We'll get our heads blown off if a wild shark's find these explosives. Another one says, Yeah, they're keeping us pinned down. No way out. Hoppy replies, Well, I'm not so sure, boys. Look what's coming. Get ready. At this moment, the runaway horses pulling the loaded wagon are coming right past the place where they're hiding. Hoppy and his pals grab hold of the side and hang on unseen by Calico's gang and get a free ride to safety. When the wagon disappears, Calico and her men across the street in an office window high above look down at the spot where they'd seen Hoppy a minute ago. And one of them exclaims, Hey, they disappeared! First picture, bottom row. Some distance from the freight office, Hoppy and his two companions, who've been hanging on to the side of the wagon, drop off as Hoppy says, Far enough, boys. Let's double back and try to get him behind. Thinking Hoppy is still hiding in the freight office, Calico and her men are closing in to smoke him out. When they're just a few feet from the freight office, one of the men puts a shot directly into a box of blasting powder. And... Last picture, the freight office goes up in a gigantic explosion, taking some of Calico's men with it. Ooh, and maybe Calico will think that Hoppy was killed by the explosion because he was in the freight office. Yes, and thinking he's dead, they won't expect him to suddenly appear from behind it. No, I hope he makes it. So do I. And don't forget to follow Hoppy in the daily papers, too. Oh, I won't forget that because I just love Hoppy. Good. Now... Oh, let's see what's over the page. It ought to be Prince Valiant. You're right, it is Prince Valiant on now, page three. I'm anxious to read that because Prince Valiant and his friends are on their way to do an errand for Val's father. And everywhere they went, houses were burned and things were destroyed and 
And even people killed. It was awful. Yes, cruel barbarian soldiers had been sweeping over that part of the country, destroying everything that came before them. And just when Val came to the top of a hill, he saw the whole army before him. I wonder what's going to happen. Well, let's read now and find out. With Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckett, Gray Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> The rear guard of a horde of barbarians turns toward Prince Valiant, Egil, Rufus, and Arf. They finger their weapons and smile in anticipation at the thought of further slaughter. Val puts aside his lance and draws the singing sword, saying, Remembering the burning village we passed and the horrible evidence of that visit, I must do a little work. Will you join me? They do, and Val and his friends ride at the rear guard. And in a very short time, the barbarian soldiers know they have met four tornadoes. After their moment of pleasure, Val and his friends gallop laughingly away. All morning, they search unsuccessfully for a way across the towering mountains. Last picture of the row, they share lunch with a wandering friar, and he tells them of a monastery in the hills whose abbot knows of a secret pass through the mountains. First picture, bottom row, late that afternoon, Val and his friends come to the monastery where lives the abbot who knows of the secret pass. Val and his friends stop and gaze at it. The monastery is perched in a soaring crag, impregnable as any fortress, where Christians are being persecuted by the surging pagans. Val thinks that surely no one could capture this fortress, placed as it is in such an out-of-the-way and almost unreachable spot. Last picture, they are at the door, which is open to them. And Val and his friends are made welcome and enter into one of the strangest segments of medieval life. What does a medieval life mean? Well, that was the time of history, which was about 700 years ago, the Middle Ages of man, which was marked by an earlier way of thinking and living, uh, just the way we see it in Prince Val. Oh, oh I, I see I wonder what's going to happen to Val in this castle. Oh, I'm sure that when the abbot finds out that Val is a good man, he'll tell Val how to get over the mountain. I hope so. Yes. Well, now would you like to read Dick's Adventures? Oh, yes, please. Very well. If you'll turn over to the last page of the first section... Oh, oh here, here, Dick is. He's right on the top of the page. Uh, Dick is with General Washington in the early days of America. Yes, he's with General Washington's army, and it's a cold, cold winter. The soldiers don't have enough to eat, and they don't have warm clothes. Washington has been slipping away from the British commander because he doesn't want to fight until he knows he can win. I'm anxious to find out what's going to happen today. Well, very well, here we go with Dick's Adventures. And say the magic words with me. rickety pack a zack a zick Let's have music for Adventurous Dick. Dick is with Washington's army back in 1776. An army driven by the British into what looks like a hopeless position on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River. Suddenly, Dick realizes that it's Christmas Day. There's no Yuletide cheer, only a yearning for victory and peace. Officers bent hard against the storm are hurrying out of Washington's field headquarters. They are General Nathaniel Green, Colonel Alexander Hamilton, and James Monroe. Dick thinks to himself, something's big is going to happen today. Last picture, top row... A few minutes later, the whole camp learns what it is. Washington is determined to catch the smug British forces off guard by moving his men secretly back across the Delaware and attacking the enemy-held town of Trenton. First picture, next row. The men prepare for the crossing. Because the Delaware is storm-swept, desperately dangerous to cross with men and cannon, just for these reasons, Washington is crossing it. He's sure the British won't expect it. About four o'clock the next morning, just a few hours before dawn, the last boats cross the river with Washington's army and cannons. Dick exclaims, Hey, we've got almost everybody across. Well, gee, this looks familiar. First picture, bottom row, Washington's army's on the march through the wind and snow, heading for Trenton, New Jersey. The cannons are placed and loaded. And then comes the command. Fire! enemy is surprised, terrified, and utterly confused. Trenton is overrun by Washington's men. Dick yells, 
Ah, and they thought Washington was late. They thought... Then Dick sits up in bed, his eyes wide open, and he recognizes his own room in the year 1951, and he says, Oh, I've only been dreaming again. Oh, wasn't that wonderful? Yes, that was really daring, crossing that rough river in those small boats in the middle of winter and at night. Oh, I just love Dick's adventures because he has the most wonderful dreams. And next week, I'm sure he'll have another one just as exciting. Oh, goody. Oh, look, look, here's Rusty Rowdy right underneath Dick's adventures. And, and uh, last week, uh, Squire Boggs had found Rusty trailing him, and he locked Rusty below deck on the old schooner. Yes, but Rusty got out and saw Squire Boggs up to his mean business. And then Squire Boggs and Captain Coon went down in the boat to get Rusty, and Rusty slipped over and locked them up. And just then, Tex and Mr. Kilgore, the government treasury agent, were on their way to find Rusty. Oh, I hope they get there in time. That's me. Very well. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Tex and Mr. Kilgore are following Flip, who leads them to the old schooner hulk where Rusty has Squire Boggs and Captain Clune locked below deck. Third picture, first row. Tex and Mr. Kilgore are beside Rusty on the deck of the old schooner hulk. Tex says, A suffering horned toads, lad. What are you doing here? I thought I told you to hit the hay. Rusty replies, Yeah, I know, Tex, and Mr. Kilgore, too. But, but, but I got them. They thought they had me, but I fooled them. Last picture, top row, Tex says, Well, you got who, Rusty? Hey, what are you talking about? Rusty replies, Why, well, Squire Boggs and Captain Kloon. They're in a the little cabin under this hatchway I'm sitting on. First picture, bottom row, Tex replies, Hey, great snakes, boy. You got Boggs and Kloon trapped down there? Yeah, I hear them banging on the hatch. Here, come on, Mr. Kilgore. We gotta let him out. Yeah, but wait, Tex. Wait until I tell you. Wait till I tell you what they were doing. Hey, just look in that cabin over there, Mr. Kilgore. They stored away a lot of those metal cylinders, just like the one we fished out of the water near our boathouse. Quickly, Kilgore investigates in the cabin. When he sees the metal cylinders, he exclaims, By George, I believe the boy has solved my case for me. Last picture, he says. Okay, Tex. Now we can let those two out. Thanks to Rusty, I think we're about at the end of the chase. And Tex exclaims, What? And Rusty's eyes pop wide open with astonishment. Oh, that's exciting. I can hardly wait till next week to see the look on Squire Boggs' face when he finds out that Rusty caught him. Neither can I. <laughs> Funny Dagwood and Blondie. Yes, it is. And I'll read them if you'll pick up the first page of the second section. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim, Zem, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Tootsie Woodley, Blondie's neighbor, has dropped in for a little chat, and she's telling Blondie about a movie she saw last night. She's saying, Oh, Blondie, you must go to the movies tonight. It's simply wonderful. It's so romantic. Why, honestly, Herbert is so sweet and affectionate since we saw it. And Blondie says, Really? Last picture, top row. Tootsie goes on rapturously. When he picked her up in his strong arms and carried her over the threshold, I nearly swooned. And Blondie replies, How thrilling. And then Tootsie goes home. <laughs> Blondie thinks that maybe Dagwood might become nice and romantic to her if he saw such a romantic picture. So first picture next row, she says to him sweetly, Dagwood, darling, would you like to go to the movies tonight? And Dagwood, who has settled down in a sweet chair for a long, comfortable evening at home, exclaims not so sweetly, No! So they go to the movies. <laughs> Last picture of the row, they're sitting in the theater watching a dashing hero making love to a beautiful girl on an island in the South Seas. And Blondie sighs with happiness. Oh, my. And Dagwood sighs with disgust. Ah, 
And then Dagwood falls asleep. First picture next row, Blondie shakes Dagwood, saying... Dagwood, stop dozing. Here comes the big love scene. So Dagwood wakes up just long enough to see that the hero is being pursued by South Sea natives. The hero has carried the beautiful girl to safety with a knife between his teeth as everybody sighs with relief. Oh. 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 And from Dagwood we hear... And that's the end of the picture. Dagwood, wake up. Come on, dear. Get up. Last picture of the row. Blondie has managed to get Dagwood on his feet and has gotten his hat and coat on and leading him home. And she says, Dagwood, wake up. The show is over and we're on our way home. But Dagwood doesn't know what happens. He's so drowsy. And by the time you can go, (laughs) Blondie and Dagwood are home. Dagwood leans against the front of the house, as Blondie says. Wasn't that romantic when he carried her over the threshold? But Dagwood just answers, <laughs> and then slowly slides down to the ground. And there he lies on the porch, asleep. Blondie looks at him with disappointment that he isn't carrying her over the threshold like the hero in the movie did. And she gives a sigh. Oh, well. Then takes him by the shoulders and drags him into the house, saying... We've been married a long time. (laughs) That Dagwood, that was no way to act after seeing a romantic picture like that. Well, what would you like him to do? Put a knife between his teeth and pick Blondie up in his arms and carry her all the way home? Well, no, not all the way home, but he could at least carry her over the threshold. With a knife in his teeth? No, the key. Oh, excuse me. Well, that's all right. Hey, look underneath, Blondie. Oh, goody, Roy Rogers. Last week, he ended his last adventure, so maybe he's going to start a new one today. So quick read, please. Very well, then. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. hi yip hi Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip hi <laughs> Roy is on his way to Saddle Butte, a western town. As he comes to a fork in the road, he sees a man in a wagon lashing his horses furiously. When Roy sees the man mistreating his horses, he heads after them, seizes one of the horses' bridles, and slows him down as he yells, Slow down, mister! You're running these horses to death! In a moment, Roy has stopped the wagon. The driver exclaims, Zones! It's my bosom friend, Roy Rogers. But there's no time to talk, Rogers. I must get to Saddle Butte. And Roy exclaims, J. Lucian Dangerfield, you old scalloway. Hey, what's the big hurry? And sure enough, it is J. Lucian Dangerfield, the head of the Wild West show that Roy got mixed up with once before. Lucian answers, uh, I've been ranging the countryside for livestock to use in my Wild West extravaganza, but right now, urgent business awaits me in town. Roy replies, last picture, top row. Well, you'll never get there if you don't give these horses a blow. First picture, bottom row, Lucian says, well, I'll explain later, Roy. Right now, I must... And suddenly, a man jumps up from underneath a blanket in the wagon and knocks Dangerfield out of the wagon. Oh, no! It's a convict in jailbird's clothes, and as he holds his gun on Roy, he snarls, I told you to keep this wagon moving, you jabbering old maverick. I ought to blow your head off. Reach, both of you. Roy asks, Who's your friend in the convict's suit, Dangerfield? The convict climbs out of the wagon, saying, I'm Handel's Baldwin. I want your duds, cowboy. Start peeling. Roy sees there's nothing to do but give him his clothes. And as Roy starts to untie his neckerchief, last picture, Baldwin says, I plugged two guards breaking jail, and I don't mind adding to the score. Get those duds off. Dangerfield whimpers. Oh, please, Mr. Handles, no violence, no violence. And Roy says, you won't get away with this, Baldwin. <laughs> Well, that gun on him, I don't know what else he can do. Well, maybe when he's unbuckling his own gun belt, he can pull his gun and bang, bang, before the convict knows it, he will shoot his gun right out of his hand. Well, that's something we'll have to wait till next week to find out. But now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, oh, well, it's Uncle Remus, my favorite favorite. Well, since it's your favorite favorite, we'll read that right now. So here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. Rabbit. Uh, 
Uncle Remus says, uh, This tale's about the time Brer Rabbit and Brer Bar had the argument about old Brer Ghost living in that haunted house. Yes, Brer Rabbit and Brer Bear are arguing about ghosts. And Brer Rabbit is pointing to the old house on the top of the hill, and he's saying, But I say that haunted house is so full of ghosts, it whammies. And Brer Bear replies, and you is full of ignorant. There ain't no such thing as ghosts. And Brer Rabbit says, Yeah, I bet your wagon load of watermelons to a barrel of honeysuckle juice that you is scared to spend the night in that haunted house. And Brer Bear answers, I accept the insult. You has done lost yourself a barrel of honeysuckle juice. And then Brer Bear sanders off home to prepare for his evening in the haunted house. Brer Rabbit wiggles his finger in the air. And a moment later... Brow Moth flies to him and lands on Brow Rabbit's finger. Brow Rabbit whispers something to Brow Moth, and Brow Moth flicks his wings, which means yes. And Brow Rabbit says, and Now, Brow Moth, you do just like I told you, and I'll give you and the boys an old woolen blanket for your dinner. And Brow Moth answers, Now, me and my family knows what to do. And away he flies to do what he and his family knows what. Comes the night, and Brow Bar is sitting in the haunted house beside a lighted candle, a gun in hand, a pistol beside him, an axe and a club on the floor in front of him. And he says nervously, Duh, Everybody knows there ain't no such thing as ghosts. I, uh, Oops. When all of a sudden, first picture bottom row, a thing which looks like a ghost with outstretched arms comes sailing through the air, sailing straight for Bra Bear, and it howls. And Bra Bear looks up. Bra Bear's eyes pop open in fear. And the ghost makes a dive at him. And then the ghost goes. And Bra Bear leaps to his feet. And he drops his gun and dashes for the door, yelling, The help! Save me! The ghost is going to do this! And he disappears in the distance, never stopping to see that what looks like the ghost was 300 of Bram Moth's relatives flying in close formation, making got something that looks like a white sheet. Last picture, Bram Rabbit is giving the moths a nice wool blanket, just what moths love for dessert. And he's saying, Well, Bram Moth, you sure make the fine ghost. And here's the blanket I promised you. Now everybody just sit down and have a banquet. And as the moths exclaim happily over the delicious banquet, um, sort of a moth ball, Uncle Remus says, Most folks don't wait long enough to think twice. Yes. Uh, Br'er Bear, he's a dumb one because there aren't any ghosts. <laughs> but Br'er Rabbit's little trick made him believe there are, and I'll bet you he'll never go in a haunted house again. <laughs> I'll bet he won't either. Well, now let's turn over the page. Oh, oh, there's Flash Gordon right at the top. And there's Prince Vino and Queen Sunia with Flash and Dale. They were escaping from the underground caverns which the wizard had caused to cave in on them, and their rafts were carried into the rapids of the underground river into the whirlpool. And and then when the rafts were destroyed, and it looked like they were going to drown dead, they were carried up against a huge gate or something, and they held on to the bar. So now let's read and see what's going to happen next. Very well. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon, saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash and Dale escape from the underground whirlpool while Prince Fino helps Queen Suni. Dale suddenly notices a door and she wonders if that may be a way out. Flash and Fino find a heavy beam of wood. They pick it up and last picture top row batter vainly at the stout barrier. Flash exclaims, it must be the wizard's passage to the pool. We can't break through it. We'll have to make them open it for us. But they stop trying to break it down. Fino suddenly guesses that the channel leading out of the pool through the grate must be the wizard's power turbine mill race. The grating has been put there to stop any debris like floating raw trees or logs from going into the channel where the power turbines are and destroying them. So Flash, first picture bottom row, dives down to unfasten the protective grating. Vino bravely follows him. Under the water, they find the hooks by which the grating is fastened. Working quickly, they soon have dislodged the grating. And as they come to the surface of the water again, Flash laughs... Well, the wizard will come in a hurry when all that debris hits their turbines and shuts off their metal-melting rays. And then, with another scheme in mind, 
Flash has Fino help him lift the grating up on top of the rock, just above the heavy door leading to the engine room. He barely has time to balance the heavy grating over the passage when the locked door swings open. And like angry ants, the wizard's troubleshooters swarm out of the tunnel with tools and weapons. Oh, my goodness. And Flash is up above him. And, and Flash is going to drop the grating down on him and knock him down, isn't he? That's the plan. Oh, I'll bet you that's why he wanted to make the engine stop so they would come out and see what happened. That's right. And Flash intends to overpower the guards and slip into the engine room himself and maybe find a way out. I can hardly wait until next week to see if he succeeds. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to. Well... Oh, oh, read this one more, please. Oh, all right, then. Let's go back to the very first page, and we'll read Snookums. All right. Oh, oh goody. Here, here it is. And here we go with little old Snookums. Diddly-da, diddly-do, wick-a-mack-a-mookums. Let's have a little tune for little Snookums. <laughs> Archie buys a pretty little puppy for Snookums and brings it home. Last picture top row, he puts the puppy down on the ground before Snookums, saying, Snookums, my boy, look at the nice little puppy that Daddy bought for you. And Snookums is so happy, he runs for the little puppy with his arms outstretched, saying, Oh, isn't he cute? <laughs> a little later, Archie hears Snookums crying because the puppy ran away, first picture bottom row. So Archie goes looking for it. And he finds a puppy in front of the house. And he exclaims, Oh, there he is. I'll get him, Snookums. And so he tiptoes toward it. And then Archie makes a leap at the puppy. And finds that his head has banged against an iron dog. And Archie, his eyes blackened and his head aching with pain, comes in the house, last picture. And Rosie asks him if he saw the cute little cast iron dog she bought for the lawn. And Archie exclaims, I did don't. He had to bring Snookums the puppy the same day that Rosie brought the iron dog because they both looked just alike. Poor Archie. Yes, poor Archie. He certainly got fooled that time. He thought the iron dog was the real dog. Well, now that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with a little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.